so this is judging a book by its cover how inclusive is your community i am alana burke my pronouns are she her i work at amazie.io you can find me on drupal.org at aberk626 you can find me on the drupal slack at alana burke and my twitter is also aberk626 um, just a note about our code of conduct. Of course, we expect everyone to follow it. And if you have any issues, you can contact me or Sean, um, whoever you're more comfortable with. Um, I know that we rarely have any issues here at this camp, but I just wanted to mention that. Oh, we got someone else coming in here. So, do you think people feel Welcome in. Did I just skip a slide to slide? Okay. Do you think people feel welcome in open source? Do you think people feel welcomed in the Drupal community? Well, when it comes to open source, the numbers say that they don't. According to the 2017 Open Source Survey, the number of respondents who said that they've experienced a negative reaction was a negative interaction was 18%. And the number of respondents who said that they had witnessed a negative interaction was 50%. The number of respondents who stopped working on a project because of a negative experience was 21%. That's one in five people. And the number of respondents who encountered dismissive responses was well over 50%. And there were a lot of different statistics about things that people observed and things that they said were important to them. So I just pulled out a few of those. 67% of respondents said that the license was very important when deciding whether to contribute a per, to a project. So what kind of license, how permissive it was, how restrictive it was. So I just thought that was really interesting because that has a lot to do with sort of the personality of a project. And documentation is a really important part of your community and your project and how it works. And we're going to talk about that. 93% of respondents so that they observe incomplete or missing documentation. And as my new job is to work on documentation, I believe that 100%. <laughs> so this was a really good quote that I found on a post at Hoodie about welcoming communities. A lot of people enjoy contributing to open source projects. And open source projects love contributions, and yet, I keep seeing newcomers struggling to contribute and project maintainers struggling to find contributors. So what's the catch? And if we can answer that, I think we'd solve a lot of problems. So in this talk, we're gonna talk about what makes an open source community welcoming. And I've broken it down into a few sections. You need a good code of conduct. You need to focus on your events and your speakers. You need ease of entry and contribution. You need accessibility. You need to focus on your leadership. You've got to take a look at your website and your social presence. And you need to focus on mentorship and documentation. So let's talk about a good code of conduct. Does your community have a good, prominently published, prominently displayed code of conduct? What about an anti-harassment policy? Is it clear how you handle conflict? Is it clear who to talk to? Are there multiple people to talk to? Do you have people of different genders to talk to? For example, I suggested to Sean that we should add me, since I'm one of the organizers of the camp this year, to the list of people to talk to because I thought, well, historically, a lot of the people who report things are women, and they would probably be a lot more comfortable talking to a woman about them. Not that there's anything wrong with Sean. I think Sean's a great guy. I think he's really easy to talk to. But if I were a woman and I had to report something potentially embarrassing or uncomfortable, as a lot of, unfortunately, violations are, 
I'm going to talk to a woman about it. So I thought, let's just put my name on there. It's not a big deal. So I really truly think that a good code of conduct is the most important thing starting in your community. It should be robust. Don't worry that you're being too specific. If you're too broad, you might regret it later. You may want to supplement your code of conduct with an anti-harassment and anti-discrimination policy. Make these explicit. Do not tolerate any form of discrimination. State the forms of discrimination that you do not tolerate. Don't just say that you don't tolerate discrimination. Someone will come back and they will nitpick you and they will say, well, you didn't say you didn't tolerate this type of discrimination. You might also want a values and ethics statement. This helps your community know, you know, what kind of values do you embrace as a community? What kind of ethics do you embrace? The Drupal community did this in the last couple of years. It just gives you an idea of, you know, what kind of, what kind of humans do we want in this community? What, what do we want to be thinking about? What, where do we want our focus to be as humans? And it sort of says like, hey, if this isn't your vibe, then maybe this isn't your community. And you also want a separate events code of conduct that deals with how you should behave in person. And this is really important. I don't think enough communities have a separate community code of conduct and a separate in-person events code of conduct. Leadership. What does your leadership look like? Diversity starts at the top. It does not start at the bottom. Are your leaders all white? Are your leaders all men? Take a look at the breakdown of technical roles and roles in your leadership. If all the technical roles are men, or all the support roles are women, that's also really bad. If all of your secretaries and all of your project managers and you know maybe all of your QA people, if they're all women and all of your system engineers are men, You've also got a really big problem. Even if at the end of the day, 50% of your employees are women and 50% of your employees are men, you still wanna take a look at how that breaks down. In communities, a bigger issue is unofficial leadership. You have to be mindful of the people who work publicly on your project and emerge as leaders. Be aware of who these people are and whether they're the people you want representing your project. So in open source, obviously, we don't often pay people for their work since we're volunteering. So this gets a little tricky, but I'm sure if you thought about the Drupal community, you could think of people who you see as leaders, the people who work on core, the people who contribute a lot, the people who speak a lot. No one ever deemed them leaders, no one ever named them leaders, but they emerge as leaders. So when you're, you know, if you are one of the official leaders of a community, you want to take stock of those people and decide, you know, are these all the people that we do want representing our community, whether or not they're people that we've placed there? And if they're not, you have some work to do. So if you have some toxic, unofficial leadership, hopefully mm -hmm. you've created a code of conduct and anti-harassment policies. If not, rewind, create a committee, and do that. With those in place, you should be in a better place to address any behaviors. So first, define a goal. Do you want to change this person's behavior? Do you think it's something fixable? Do you think that they're rehabilitatable, that they can come back to the community as a better contributor, as someone who is fit to be a leader? Do you think that they can come back to the community as someone who isn't a leader? Or do you want this person to step back, step down, and leave the community? So ideally, someone in your leadership has also been trained in mediation and is prepped to do this. And if not, you're gonna have to hire someone. But this is really important because if someone comes into your community, they're gonna see your unofficial leaders. They're either 
coming to an event, they're looking at your social media, they're seeing who these people are, and if they're toxic, if they're mean, if they're nasty, that's who's representing you. And that's not welcoming. Events and speakers. So it makes an event inclusive. There is so much. Accessibility should be the obvious one, but there's so much that events need to do and it is so difficult, especially on a, the, the shoestring budget that events so often have. From wheelchair access to meals, lactation rooms, quiet rooms, prayer rooms, be aware of all of the things that your community needs. Childcare, gender neutral restrooms, elevators, so much more. Communicate early and often what will be available. What's worse than not having it is your attendees not finding out that you don't have it until they're there and they need it. For example, I think we had an attendee who contacted us and said that she needed access to a lactation room and we said, okay, Unfortunately, we don't have one in this building, but this is what the facility has. This is where it is. This is what we can provide you. Is there anything else that we can do for you? You know, what else could we do to make this a smoother experience for you at the camp? That was a couple weeks ago. So she didn't just show up on the day of the camp and was like, oh, hey, I need a fridge and a lactation room. So we were able to communicate with this attendee early. And how accessible is it is to get to your conference? Price. Price is something that you know, people don't always think about in terms of inclusivity and accessibility. But if your conference or your event is expensive, it's, if it's expensive to get to, if it's in an expensive town at an expensive time of year, that keeps people from getting there. Not everyone's work pays for them to get there. And do you always hold your event in the same city if it's a national conference? Do you help with visas and other paperwork? And of course, your speaker lineup. Who's speaking? Your event is your speakers. No matter what you do, if you have a speaker lineup that doesn't look like your community, if that's how your community is going to be perceived. You could have the most diverse, inclusive, and wonderful community. And if you have a speaker lineup of a whole bunch of white dudes, that's what your community is going to be represented as. And there's no excuse for it. There's no excuse for having a speaker lineup of all white guys. There's no excuse for having a keynote lineup of white guys. There's no excuse for having a single panel of all white guys. It's just time for that to be done. It's over. And especially for keynotes, honestly, because they tend to be the most advertised pieces of your events. Also keep an eye on your after hours social events. I know people like to party and everybody likes free booze, but a lot of people also don't like booze and they also don't like loud parties. Um, like I personally, I'm, I'm down for whatever, but I have migraines and I can't go to loud parties because um, I'll be there for 10 minutes and then I have to go home to bed. So I would love more parties where it's like, let's all go somewhere that's kind of quiet and just to hang out and have a conversation at a normal volume so we don't have to scream. Um, I don't know if we still call that a party, but perhaps some sort of gathering. <laughs> um, I'm not antisocial, I just want to be able to talk and be there. But it also keeps, you know, if you don't have alcohol, then you can have people who are, you know, between 18 and 21, you can make your event more inclusive that way. It's more inclusive to anybody who doesn't drink for whatever reason that they don't drink, which isn't any of our business. Um, you know, just for a lot of reasons. So think about that. If you're having a multi-day camp with several social events, have your rager one night and have a board game night another night. But advertise the board game night as much as your big boozy rager. And with your marketing, make sure that your marketing reflects your community. If you have a diverse and inclusive community, make sure that your marketing is diverse and inclusive. Don't try to make your event look like something it's not, but if you've worked hard to have this great speaker lineup, put that on your marketing. People want to see that. They want to see, you know, what they're, they're coming and getting. And, you know, if you're using stock imagery, there's lots of great diverse stock imagery out there, so go get that. 
And also, we talked about event code of conducts, but you know, when you're having an event, be super communicative of that. Just constantly, everybody talk about the code of conduct, everybody make sure that everyone knows who to talk to. Website and social presence. What do people see when they visit you online? They should see your code of conduct, how to contribute, and they should see who contributes. Because if I'm joining a community, I want to know who else is in that community. I'm not going to just like join a social club and not know who the other people in the social club is. Like that's weird. So I want to have an idea of who the other people are. There should be an easy path to contribution. Open source is about contribution, so this should be front and center. And how do you interact on social media? Does your organization have clear social media policies? Do you have clear comment policies? And how do you handle, say, rude or negative people on Twitter? Open source communities often have many people managing a social media account, so have established communication policies in place. That way, if and when an issue arises, you'll know how to deal with it, and you'll deal with it with a more unified voice instead of one person getting upset, not knowing how to deal with it, dealing with it in a way that someone else in the organization wouldn't, having to go back and apologize, and making it a thing when it never had to be a thing. And I found, um, if you're ever unsure of how to deal with social media, look up. Um, a lot of brands publish their guidelines. Or if you just reach out to some brands on Twitter and DM them, a lot of them are happy to send you their brand guidelines. I did that when I was first starting out doing some professional social media. When like nobody, like brands weren't really on Twitter and like nobody really did social media. And a lot of us just shared all of our guidelines as like, what do we do with trolls? Nobody really knew what to do, and everyone just sort of decided we ignore them. <laughs> like when someone says something rude to a brand, like most brands just, just don't respond. It's not worth it. Okay. Ease of entry. This is such a big one. It should be as easy as possible for everyone to get started contributing to your project. And make sure you have a path for developers for inexperienced developers, for non-developers, and don't gatekeep. Documentation is important, and it's a valid way to start contributing. Fixing a typo is a valid way to make your first commit. It really, truly is. Everybody has to go through that process. Finding the smallest, tiniest thing that you know you can't screw up and making a first patch is totally valid, no matter how you do it. Also, include environment setups in your contribution setup documentation and keep it simple. Remember that not everyone is a DevOps engineer. <laughs> Make your documentation inclusive. It should be clear, navigable, and readable. Don't make people jump through hoops. You're gonna hear about some hoops later. <laughs> Let people contribute. If their contribution is bad, you can point them towards mentorship and documentation before accepting it after they fix it. So, how easy is it for people to contribute to your community? Do you tag issues for new contributors? Do you tag quick fixes? Do you tag documentation that needs to be added or improved? These are all great ways to get people contributing to your project. Be patient and kind in issue cues. Remember the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. I am so overly kind to people I talk to on the internet when they can't interpret my tone. I probably use emojis too much because I want to communicate how I'm feeling. So I put a smiley on the end so no one can misinterpret my tone because I'm smiling. <laughs> Rudeness, dismissiveness, and unresponsiveness are some of the main reasons 
the people don't contribute. I'm going to read that again. Rudeness, dismissiveness, and unresponsiveness are some of the main reasons the people don't contribute. Don't tolerate anyone who is any of those things in your issue cues. Let's talk about mentorship and documentation. A good community supports itself and the people who make it up. This includes mentoring and making sure that everything is documented properly. So, how is your mentoring program? Is your community clicky? Do you have like cool kids? Do you feel, do people feel like they can talk to existing contributors? How proactive are you in bringing in new folks? Do mentors reach out to new contributors? Or do they make contributors do the work of reaching out to mentors? Because that's a big difference. Everything needs to be documented. Everything. Document it. All documentation should be in the same place. Open source code is only as good as its documentation. Document how to contribute. Document how to mentor. Document how to add documentation. <laughs> Document it all. What good is having all this code if nobody knows how to use it? Nobody knows how to make it better. Keep your documentation clean, clear, and searchable. Accessibility. There are so, so many things that accessibility encompasses. So, you know, both online and in person, so these are just a handful. Do your conference videos have captions? Do you offer sign language translations if needed? Is your website readable on screen readers and other devices? Do your events offer meals that meet dietary restrictions? Is your event signage in a large, high contrast font? What about Braille? Is there Braille in the building where you hold your events? Do you use gender neutral language in communications? Accessibility is about humans being able to fully take part and fully engage. So sit down, analyze every part of your community, every website, every communication avenue, every event, and ensure that every human can engage fully in every one of these. And then, that's accessibility. So we're gonna take a look at some popular open source communities. And so I took those categories that I made and I picked out a few open source communities and I looked around to see what I could find. I did not go through any extraordinary avenues, like I didn't ask people that I knew in the communities if I couldn't find this stuff, I decided it was not, it wasn't there. So let's start with WordPress. Code of Conduct, there is no link on the homepage. They have an events code of conduct and they talk about making a code of conduct for your event, but if they have a community code of conduct, I cannot find it anywhere. I found something on Stack Exchange about making a community code of conduct, but it does not seem they've ever followed through with it. I think that's a huge, huge red flag. Leadership. Could not find anything about how the project is governed, aside from there's the, the guy who made it. Events and speakers, you do a great job here. WordCamp, cheap, accessible, seems to be really well run. It focuses a lot on diversity and inclusion. Website and social presence, it's fine, it's there. Nothing bad to say about it, but you don't get a sense of the community. Like You don't get a sense of who WordPress developers are, who's active in the WordPress community, like who, who's doing this. Ease of entry and contribution. They have a get involved link right on the homepage. Very easy pass to contributions, so that seemed really great. Accessibility, 
It's looked really good. Um, they have a lot in the WordCamp Organizer's Handbook about physical accessibility in their events. Mentorship and documentation. It looked like they had a mentorship program and their documentation is very extensive and very easy to read. Um, oh, and some other things, some other notes I made about WordCamp US. Uh, they focus a lot on accessibility. They have nursing rooms, they have childcare, and they even provide sanitary products in the restrooms at conferences. They noted that. I was like, that's such a little thing, but that's so nice. Okay, Kubernetes. Um, they had a prominent link to their code of conduct on their community homepage. I could also find nothing about their leadership at all. Um, some of the Kubernetes stuff was a little confusing because like, some of it's under the Linux Foundation and some of it's not. So that was, but I was looking for like the Kubernetes project specifically. Um, the big Kubernetes events like KubeCon look good. They have a code of conduct, child care, big diversity and inclusion efforts. The website's like pretty jargon filled, not super clear. Like if you didn't know what Kubernetes was, but your boss was like, you should learn about Kubernetes and you went to their website, you would be like, this is absolutely terrifying. I don't know what's going on. Um, social media is pleasant, it's informative. Again, not a huge sense of like, who makes up the Kubernetes um, community. There's a contribute button in the homepage footer, so pretty easy access there. Um, as far as accessibility goes, the documentation is pretty accessible. There's a ton of documentation. Um, I've had to use it for work. It's pretty good. I did not find anything about mentorship programs in the community. Mozilla, one of the biggest open source projects out there. Prominent link on their community homepage to their code of conduct. Their leadership. Um, they have the Mozilla Core and the Mozilla Foundation. There is gender diversity within it. It is extremely white. At first I was making these graphics that I was going to put on here, but they wound up being too huge where it was like, I'm going to highlight all of the white people in here, but then I was just like, no, it's almost all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, events and speakers, they have many, many free and low cost events, both online and around the world. They have tons of websites and social media presence. They're very, very active there. Um, they have a lot of, they seem to have a lot of folks on, in terms of like dev relations and things like that. Very detailed paths to contribution and, and volunteering. Like they have a lot of initiatives and projects. So it's sort of like you pick one and then here's how to get started. So that seemed really great. Accessibility is a major Mozilla initiative. And they had lots of documentation and help available. So this was one of the first projects that I looked at that I was like, if I were just like randomly like, I'm gonna work on an open source project because that sounds like a thing that I should do and I don't have any idea what that means. And I was just Googling and I came on this one, like I would do that. I would be like, okay, Mozilla, you sound cool. But then there's Linux. Probably one of the most famous and oldest open source projects. So they recently adopted the Contributor Covenant, which was nice of them to finally do, but it was hotly debated, which was really sad. Their leadership is so overwhelmingly white and male. There are hardly any women, there are hardly any people of color. Um, and I think the only people of color were of Asian descent, if I remember correctly. Their events are stupid expensive. They do offer some scholarships. Their website is just the linux.org forum, that's it. The Linux Foundation does have social media, the project does not. They're above that, I guess. Ease of entry and contribution. It's impossible and it's designed as such. So you currently not, from what I can tell, you currently cannot contribute to the Linux kernel. At some point you could, and you had to do a series of very complicated code tests which somehow involved at some point you had to like email somebody and they would start sending you the code tests or something like that. And then you had to do all these code tests and then maybe they would let you contribute. But from what I can tell that path is no longer, like they're not even accepting people to do that. So I, um, I could possibly be wrong, but it seemed like you cannot actually contribute to the Linux kernel right now. 
quality was not the best, especially because most of their tech is from like 1997. Which some of it may make it more accessible, but some of it it doesn't. Mentorship and documentation, again, it's not centralized, but I mean, there are people who talk about how to do stuff on like the Linux.org forums, and there is like documentation out there. It exists, but that's really all I can say about it. So Linux, like, it really bummed me out, because like, I could just imagine someone being like, oh, Linux, like, I would love to contribute to Linux, and then Googling it and being like, this is the saddest thing ever. And then I took a look at Drupal, and I tried to be very critical about it. But we do have, a, if you go to Drupal.org, we do have a link to our code of conduct. It's very easy to find. It's right in the footer. We also have our events code of conduct. And we revise these periodically. They're living documents. We have the Drupal Association Board of Directors. Um, DrupalCon is expensive, and it is held primarily in Western countries, and it does not pay our speakers. So I'll be totally honest about all of those. Um, that said, as someone who's served on the um, track team as a chair for the last three years for the North American Conference, I think we have done a whole lot for diversity and for otherwise making our conference really accessible. We have informed a website, and I think we have pretty good social staff. Um, our social media can be pretty dry, but in the last couple of years especially, I think the, our official Twitters have been really good at boosting um, the smaller communities. Twitters and keeping an eye on what you know the camps and stuff are doing and giving a lot of signal boost to this. So I think that's more important than having a clever social presence. And that also gives a sense of what the community is doing. So by you know showing what all the smaller communities are doing. Ease of entry and contribution, we have a button right on the home page um, that you know leads to our contribution paths. Accessibility is one of our major initiatives and focus. Um, mentorship and documentation, we have our mentor initiative, and we have tons of documentation on, documentation on Drupal.org. Um, it can be better, um, but it exists, and I think it is, um, all things considered, I think it is pretty good. A quick question about your Drupal Association Board of Directors. You didn't mention like what your diversity um, That's because I don't currently know what it is, and when I originally wrote this talk, it was in flux. I think they had just brought some new people in, so I was not sure on the exact breakdown, and I forgot to do it. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows, I think it is pretty, I know it's good gender-wise, and I think there are, are you Googling this right now for me, Fatima? <laughs> I know there are people of color on the board. I do not know how many, but we're going to find that out, because my next thing was... I don't know that I can just... Um, <laughs> my next thing was, do you have any questions? <laughs> Where do I get to the board? Just look, just go. Under association and then the board. Where is association? Um, oh. It should not be up there somewhere. Why are you doing <laughs> Services, communities, resources. I got it. Hold on. Oh, it's under give. Of course it's under give. So we've got Dries, Adam, Audra, Batty, Ryan, Ingo, Michelle, George, Susanna, Michelle, Luma, Leslie, Grace, Owen, and Lo. So that's one, two, three, four. De it's hard to tell from not knowing these people. That's at least four people of color. And one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven women out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen people. Could be better. And that was kind of the. It's, so you, that was you looking at their. That's me looking at their pictures. I, yeah. They didn't say anything, but no. Um, but that's. It's a heck of a lot better than the other boards I broke down for. Also, the boards were enormous. Ours was fairly small. We also have an advisory board, but they do not have pictures of them. Any other questions? Do you have any input on uh, language barriers if you're not a native English speaker? 
Yeah, language barriers. That is a tough one. Um, I think one thing that can be super helpful for communities is especially, you know, in the Drupal community, set your website up to be translatable. It's, you know, especially if you're making a fairly su simple website in Drupal, it is not difficult at all. Um, so, you know, obviously Google can translate it passively, but, you know, we have built-in translation in, in Drupal, so if you know that you're targeting, you know, if you live in an area with lots of, say, Spanish speakers, you know, putting it into Spanish is a good idea, or, you know, if you're targeting a specific audience, um, one of the best things you can do is to just write simply. Um, if anyone was at Amy June's Inclusive Content Strategy talk, one of the things she mentioned is like anything that you're writing anywhere in the US, you never want to write it more than a ninth grade level. And there's lots of different editors that can help analyze that. And that helps um, for everyone, whether you have limited literacy or your English is a second language, but it keeps it at a level that more people can understand. Um, so I think, I think the other thing, because I was, I, was I was at that one as well, and I think that even people who get to English is their first language, they might not understand, um, they might not be embedded in that particular community, and but they're, they're looking to get into it. If it's in a ninth grade level, then at least they can understand uh, more about that particular topic than if they, if, you know, because I think when we talk amongst ourselves in a community, we use jargon and we also use, um, we might, you know, we might talk in a 12 or above college grade, but we understand uh, there's so much background we're bringing to that conversation that I mean, people might not have if you're, that should, and that's, so that's another reason I think that talking at a ninth grade level, even for people who might uh, have a college degree, might even be whatever, but they're not familiar with that particular niche. Yeah, I totally agree. Like I've just switched to writing documentation for a living and I'm I've actually started writing and this might be one of my future talks. I've started writing a manual of style like for us and sort of writing like you know make sure that you if you're going to use any abbreviations that you define what they are and make sure that you know you're not using super complex sentences and that you're um you know all sorts of things and I'm um, grade level is one of them and I'm trying to I'm doing several passes of our documentation but my last one is to analyze it by grade level and just sort of all these things that like I'm trying not to make assumptions that the person who is reading this has like any knowledge of what's going on so even if it seems like I'm defining and sometimes I'm just making a glossary and linking words down there if I'm like well it might be I don't want to insult someone by defining this in the text and it's getting a little wordy but I'm just gonna link it down here or be like oh here's our appendix like see appendix a for more on you know reverse proxies or something like that so it's like if you don't know about this we'll tell you about it but I'm not assuming you don't know about it but I'm also not assuming you do know about it <laughs> so I'm trying to do a lot like that um, and it's been really helpful I think Yeah, well, it's also like, because I write, well, most of my documentation is for IT support professionals here at, at the university. But uh, but I have new, we always have turnover in our departments with uh, IT support professionals. So they might understand what I'm talking about jargon-wise, but they don't necessarily understand the, the Princeton experience around, you know, these, these various solutions. So that's another reason it might be easier to just to come and bring the, bring, bring the, con you know, the, the content down a level so that they can kind of, you can when you're writing it, can also like think about it in in like okay, you know what if I was explaining this to ninth grader, how would I explain this so that you're like oh they probably don't know what desk mean they probably don't know what you know um, MDM means so just using you know I like that idea of adding um, kind of these little pop ups that might have definitions yeah yeah I started doing because I was writing a business document and then I was like oh I could put this in all of our documents though that wouldn't hurt so that's yeah, been that's a great idea yeah. So anything else? Don't forget that tomorrow we have um, a contrib day all day, but also if you're a first time contributor and you want to do something like correct a typo in your very first patch or correct documentation or anything harder than that, um, Amy June is going to be running a first time contrib workshop from 10 a.m. to noon. So you can check that out or you can just come for some contrib and mentoring. Lots of people will be there. Thank you. Thank you.